Pace is okay. I kind of get going fast and get wound up. This works. All right. Am I going to make you sleep if I turn off the... Actually, help. Huh? Let me hit the light. Yeah, I can see it, all right? Can I see, see it okay? It's nice lights, lights out. Yeah. Lights out? Lights Better? Lights okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. we're going to talk about trail terms. Besides, um, <laughs> this is a pretty, pretty technical trail term. Critical. Um, and, and rolling contour. We're going to talk about the different parts of a trail. So we're going to have a vocabulary. So let's start broad. Um, so, the word corridor, horrible word. I mean, not intrinsically horrible. Used for many different things, kind of like the word trail. It means a lot of different things to different people. In the planning process, we say a conceptual corridor. Like, oh, maybe we go from here to there. Then we'll talk about, when I use the word corridor, I, I say, all right, we laid out a corridor, meaning trail is generally somewhere in here in this, you know, 30 to 300 foot wide area. You know, with somewhere within here, we're going to put a little trail. Finished an easement, a uh, conservation easement actually, uh, with the trail easement as part of it for the whole property with Boulder County uh, this January. There, our easement corridor was this line plus or minus 100 meters. 100 meters this way, 100 meters that way. Within that trail, we're going to, within that easement, we can go to do our design work, do our construction work, build the trail, at which point the easement actually changes to. Uh, center line plus 10 meters, I think. So we have a little room for maintenance or, or little tweaks and, and changes later if we have a maintenance issue like you do. Yeah. Corridor, when it comes to the parts of a trail, is more narrowly defined. Think of it as the hallway, right? And you'll hear corridor also being used as uh, corridor clearing or clearing limits. So you'll see on the specs, our clearing limits are six feet wide, 12 feet high, or four feet wide, seven feet high, wherever we see. So that's the that's our corridor width, our clearing width. There'd be a height too. This would be the hillside, so this would be your existing slope or your cross slope, right? Mm -hmm. This point where it goes from the natural landscape into our trail structure called the hinge point. Some people also call this the hinge point. Kind of like the word punction. There's like seven different types of, like you can hear word punction and depending on where you are in the country and which agency, it could be seven different, totally different structures. This surface is called the back slope. The part this bench that you walk on is called the tread, or the broader part from the inside of the back slope all the way to the outer edge where it goes down the hill again. I call that the trail bench because quite frequently we may have a trail bench that's 48 inches wide per spec, but really our active travel surface might be narrower and might even have some like obstacles or anchors and kind of meander within the trail bench a little. A, a, a decent, not a great, but a decent road to trail conversion might still have the full road width and some drainage and things put in, but but the trail itself meanders within that road bench. So I would call that the active tread. The lower edge, the outer edge of the trail bench or the trail, the tread, whatever you want to call it, the outer point, we call it the critical edge. That's the part that can trap water. That's why we call it critical edge. It's also kind of the, the point we most keep track of during construction. This whole area, right, <laughs> generally called the trailway. You don't have to remember all these. We're gonna, we'll get down to the few, the few that matter. That's the trailway, kind of like the hallway, right? Trail goes through here. The terms you guys are going to use the most are bench or clearing lip, bench, back slope, critical edge. Let's go have a look at a corridor. Let's go out this door. Everybody up? Comfortable. <laughs> Down that way. Go, go, go.
five feet. capturing some of the same points. You know, basically here was our hillside, our cross slope. What's this called? This stuff here? Backslope. Backrest? Backrest, it is a bit too much. Backslope. What's this piece? Tread. Tread, yeah. Tread, trail away, whatever. Tread's fine with me. What's this point, this Critical. edge? Critical edge. Critical edge, yes. Here's the section view, right? We're talking about outslope. We're saying this isn't flat. It's tilted out a little bit. When we round it, you know, all of our corners actually get a little rounded. Part of that is actually so we don't have water accelerating after the corner. And erosion happens through a process called head cutting. So <coughs> if you have water running down and a little rut, it's not that the rut starts here and gets bigger, you know, gets gets longer this way. It's actually eroding here. The rut. Uh -huh. If why do you say that the critical point is what you watch the most intently, and how do you do that during the construction? If I'm not jumping ahead, definitely jumping ahead a little bit. Okay. Sorry. But I'll answer it a little bit now. Okay. This is the point that if we get stuff piled up, mm -hmm. this is the easiest place to get stuff debris piled up and you kind of lose track of what is the natural elevation here. Mm -hmm. If you end up with a hump, you can end up, you know, basically you've now got a ditch that's going to convey water. If this gets covered with soil on top of duff and you think that's your bench, and then you build a bench and people walk on it, it'll sink and you get split level trail so that people then walk around and it gets wider. So this is the this is the hardest point to watch. Um, you'll feel this in the field. You'll you'll see it. I mean, yep. you felt this for a couple of days, right? Yep. I'm cracking the thing. Watch your edge. Watch, watch your edge. Watch clean your edge. Sorry, boss. <laughs> right? <laughs> Wendy, are you're back at Brainerd, right, for the second project? Um, yeah. Yeah, I cannot make this coming Saturday at work, but the second project. If, is Brainerd, if yes. you remind me when we're up there, I can show you some cool. of the places where we've done some of that traditional bench cut stuff. And you can kind of look at what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. Up, I can do August 1st. I think this, so. this project I was working on, or that we were mm -hmm. working on together today, I think I'm going to finish Monday, but if it goes along, I might be able to get some sleep up there for a couple hours. It's pretty straightforward. If you can't, if you can't make this Saturday, I might be able to get a couple hours uh, in the field with some people at this local project. Cool. Just yeah, I want Monday throw it out there. Monday, okay. So possibly Monday. Um, we will almost always build what we call full bench trail, meaning that here's our hillside, 
we've excavated our entire tread. We've taken out this material here mm -hmm. and not disturbed this material. This is hard, this is compacted, this is naturally firm. Evenly firm, generally. There might be some little, like, a rock came out and we fill it in, but generally evenly firm. There's partial bench or uh, half bench or cut and fill where you take this soil and you pile it up down here. Problem is, this is not consolidated, this fill soil. People walk on it, it tends to sink. Mm -hmm. There are situations we do it, but it's really, it's not that much of a labor saving. So people think, oh, cool, I'm only cutting half as much soil out, right? Mm -hmm. It's really not a labor savings in the long haul because you have to deduct this, you have to create a way for this soil to adhere to this soil, and you have to compact the, the jeezies out of that. That's the other technical term. Mm -hmm. The living daylights out of the soil, or it sloughs. And it's really hard to get this solid. You have to put all this fill down here as well. There are places that we do it. Often we'll have to put some sort of a retaining wall when we do it. Mm -hmm. um, with machinery, you can sometimes get away with it because you have a 3,500 pound tool driving back and forth over it to compact it. Um, but even then, we often still spec full bench, even if we're allowing equipment to build it. So think full bench. We're going to talk about full bench. We're not going to talk about this, because we don't want to do that unless we have to. One more piece of um, anatomy. Protrusions and obstacles. So here's our trailway, right? You've got trees, you've got boulders. Protrusions would be little things sticking into the trail that are avoidable. Little rock sticking up, branch, or this or that, or whatever. They're generally avoidable. Usually on the specs we'll say, you know, okay, such and such width for the bench, such and such clearing, clearing limits, vertical, you know, horizontal and vertical. And we'll also say something about protrusions. Protrusions three up to three to six inches, common but not continuous, or um, you know, frequent but not common, or occasional. You know, so how often do you come across a protrusion, and what's how big would it be? And we'll also talk about obstacles. Obstacles are something that a user must go over or encounter on, uh, over, under, on, usually over, not under, but sometimes it can be under, like a branch, um, or around-ish ducking to stay on the trailway. So an obstacle is mandatory, I guess you could say, right? You have to go over, you have to do it. You can't just easily go around it. We'll say obstacles up to 8 inches, up to 10 inches. Remembering, however, that path of least resistance applies, what's most attractive. We have an obstacle here and no obstacle on the side of the trail. People are just going to walk around it and leave the trailway. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll put in an anchor. So I would call some of these things on the sides anchors. You know, these happen to be boulders, but they are anchors. There's tree is an anchor. Mm -hmm. If you pair a couple anchors, you've got a gateway. People like gateways. Yes. Who use them? They're drawn. People are drawn to them. It's like the goalposts, the sign, you know. People just like them. They just naturally go to them. So we use those to our advantage, you know, to attract users in. All right, let's start digging. I really like building a trail. You can tell I get excited about it, right? I don't like to build the same trail twice. I like to build it once and have it work. I don't mind going back and giving it a little tune, maybe after a season or two. But generally, I want it to be low maintenance. Mm -hmm. Generally, there are exceptions to that. There are some reasons we'll build some things that are, are really fun, and maybe we've got some sediment traps and things so we don't cause as much ecological problems with erosion. And we just expect to go in there and tune this thing up every year or two. There are situations like that. WRV is probably not going to be working on any of those, so we're not going to cover them. Two basic, uh, a couple different types of construction. Um, you know, we do all this planning work, we have all this science, all this art, all this thought, forethought and flagging and documents and all this jazz. We finally get to build. Sometimes the land manager is going to build it themselves, in-house, their staff. Sometimes they're going to hire a contractor. Sometimes they're going to work with a partnership group like WRB, like a mountain bike club, like Colorado 14ers, um, to come in and bring like volunteers. Graders. Yeah, they're great. Like they're graders. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Or there'll be a hybrid approach where maybe you're using, you know, two or all three of these different types. You know, youth cores could be another piece. I put them in the, sort of in the contractor, although sometimes they're managed by a partner group. 
Sterling's allowed a consultant to oversee some of this. That's actually a lot of what I do. Um, we'll call it hybrid construction when you have professionals and volunteers working together or having different roles in the same project. We've also got mechanized versus hand built. There's time and a place for each. My job and Jamie's job a lot of times, we got to specify the product, not always specify how it's done. Specify the product, not the method, right? We'll have, you know, sometimes big, you know, biggish equipment. This is a six foot excavator. It's big for a trail. Moving rocks that are way bigger than it was designed to handle. <laughs> well, um, we were doing a little of this actually last year with digger that we rented with WRV. Yeah. You know, moving some rocks. Or maybe we're doing some hand built. This was Picasso actually. Okay. Let's go through the step by step. You ready? Roll up your sleeves. We're going to do this. Yeah. Wearing your sunscreen, your gloves, your eye protection, your boots, maybe your shorts. I don't care, Dan. You can wear shorts. Yeah. Um, the very first step in trail construction has nothing to do with tools or PPE. It has to do with understanding what we're trying to build. What's the goal? Right? This is where, you know, we can show up and be like, hey, cool, hillside. I even see these little pink pin flags. Sweet, trail's going there. Starting to build. Well, all sorts of problems with that. What are we trying to build? This wide? This wide. Mm -hmm. Something in between. How smooth should the finish be? What's our drainage situation look like? What are we doing with the vegetation we scrape away? What are we doing with the soil that's left over? How about which side of the flags are we supposed to be on? <laughs> right? Or is, that, or is that the center point? Or is that the center line? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is all information you need to know as a crew leader. A lot of it's going to be contained. You know, there's going to be all the what we call the field control, the, f the, s the flagging, the stakes, all that jazz. But we're going to have construction notes of some sort. Um, I'll call them the specs document. Sorry, I'm used to working with agencies and contractors. You'll hear me say, look at your specs. And that just means your construction notes. These can come in an overall spec, you know, where, and a lot of times I'll try to say, here's the trail. It's going to be, it's, it's for service class two or up, you know, low, upper class two, lower class three. I'm going to specify, you know, who's on it. I try to capture the character I'm looking for a little bit just in kind of playful, like in, in, in common language versus a tight specification and we take all the fun out of it. But then I also capture, okay, what's our clearing width? What's our clearing height? You know? Mitchell, Waldrop, last couple of years, who was on Waldrop? Some, who, who worked at Waldrop? Cross country speed. Right. You had, yeah, so you had, you know, summer users, mostly hikers, some bikes, and, and mm. elk and moose, I mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you had skiers. So we would actually had a funny spec where we said, okay, we need to be um, six to eight feet wide is our corridor. Again, it's a guideline. So anywhere that you're down a hill and need to snow plow to stop, six to eight feet wide. Yep. Of stuff that was above 24 inches, it didn't matter what was down here. That's covered in s that's covered with snow in the winter. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. Yep. And then we had to be at least 12 to 14 feet high when you're standing on four to six feet of snow skiing. Right? Some of our quarter clearing we had to do after there was snow. Which is really fun to hang on to a chainsaw and a stick when you're on skis. <laughs> um, our, you know, what's, how wide is the tread? And usually I try to specify a range. You know, it doesn't have to be all the same. Maybe we can say 48 inches. It needs to be 48, but there might be, like in the hallway, there might be some obstacle or some ankle in intruding. That's fine. With the outslope, um, usually this, the grade piece is more of a design level. Um, Spec, we won't see this too much with, as a crew leader. Um, point grade, you know, so overall, what's our maximum grade? Sustained grade, maybe less than 10%. Or any given point, how steep could we be? Again, less than protrusions, you know, how big, how often? This doesn't say how often. Obstacles, same thing. Frequency, I guess it says how often. How much of the trail in 100 feet, how many feet have protrusions and obstacles? Right? 10%, 20%, 90%. Yeah, that's our toughest trail. Mm -hmm. Right? Some of it, actually, some of some of the water up yeah, last year, yeah. we did lower class two, it. rugged. I mean, it was like nasty. Protrusions and obstacles can be frequent and continuous. And they just need to be the most attractive route. Mm -hmm. so people don't go around. Oh, yeah. 
Um, you know, trend, again, we're going full bench unless we're retaining wall. This is just a sample spec sheet. Back soap, what are we doing with it? We blend it with the parent material. Um, spoiled, what are we doing with those? Okay, we're broadcasting. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And is there any finish work? You know, are we seeding or leaf litter slash whatever? Um, we can also see it's, you know, sometimes we'll have um, a linear construction log that corresponds with station staking out in the field. I've tailored this to the VRV style. There's different styles I use with different clients, whatever they're used to using. You know, at section 00 to 100, we're going to reclaim the borrow pit, and here's the work to be done. Or build some steps here, or leave this gateway, leave this pinch. You know, we'll do some call outs for specific items at this spot mm. relative to that overall guideline. So this is overarching unless call them out differently here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Um, field control, that stuff like the pin flagging, right? Sometimes it could be a ribbon flagging like this. Uh, some of the projects I do, we only flag the corridor and it's a design build. You know, and some projects, if I'm sitting on a machine, sitting on a dozer, I don't always pin flag. Some tricky sections I will, maybe turns. But with volunteers, you guys will almost always have pin flag if we're building a trail. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Is that lower edge? Is it crew clutch? Center line? Is it upper edge? It's hand built. I usually recommend cr uh, critical edge. Um, unless a client requests something different. Center line can work. It's good if you have a lot of turns. But the problem is, is it tends to get trampled on. It gets disturbed during construction. It's mechanized, I'll also often flag hinge point because you can push all this dirt and still not disturb your field control. Your pin flag. Mm -hmm. Station stakes, you know those little numbers with the six of the numbers right on them? Station stakes. Um, flagging, I'll usually somewhere specify if there's a color code. You know, um, pink and orange flags are the critical edge, that, you know, right? White flag often will have a note on it, special instruction. Uh, green might be do some rest or plant something vegetative here. Uh, maybe red is an anchor or a choke. You know, this is where I want a choke placed. Blue, make sure we have a drain here. Make sure we have a one of those grid reversals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll be a color code. So in terms of understanding the goal of the project, what are, what are your resources? Who's there to give you advice? Who's there to make a final call? Who do you listen to? Is it me? Is it me? Is it Jamie? Is it Michael from the Forest Circus? Comes walking through. As a crew, you don't want to know. Who do I listen to? Because I told you to do this, do this, before a boardwalk here. And Jamie says, nah, it's dumb. It's going to rot out. Let's put a rock causeway. More work, but it's going to last longer. Well, he's right. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> and he's feeling, yeah, and is convinced he's supposed <laughs> to hack with the draw knife. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah, right? And I was in the middle of that. And, right, so, <laughs> you know, some, and some of that is that tool. Who do you turn to his dad to in that situation? Exactly. I bet, you know, maybe I'm there to be the bad guy for you because I have a hard with <laughs> a logo, right? All this, and a, and a clipboard. All of a sudden, it looks like I know what I'm talking about. Sometimes, you know, sometimes that's from Jamie's role and my role. What are your resources? Um, by the way, I find that the crew, some of the best trail builders and best trail crew leaders are the ones who ask intelligent questions, not the ones who try to come up with every answer themselves. Mm -hmm. I have less asking those people to redo something, and then they have to somehow talk to their crew and say why they redo, why are they going to have to redo work? Yeah. Right? Ask those questions. Okay, second step. By the way, being that guy is the least fun part of the job, having to wear the white gloves, um, especially with contractors when they underbid it and are behind. So we're clearing corridor. Again, we talked a little bit about this. You know, what do we trim? We're going to trim out, we're going to cut this because it's, it's, it's a hazard. If this tree was within it, but it was a large tree, we're probably going to leave it. Um, has anyone priced tree, gr tree glue lately? What's the, what's the going rate? It's expensive. It's really expensive, yeah. right? Yeah. They're Easier to le leave the tree and take it later if we want it than to take it and then we can't put it back, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with branches. We're going to you know, clear some of this woody veg. 
maybe I'll take the whole shrub. So, corridor clearing. Sometimes pruners, there's the whole three step method, all that stuff we won't go into. All right. Should get, get Dan's autograph now because he's about to be famous. Oh boy. I, <laughs> I made Dan do some work today. <laughs> and, and, and prove he's actually working. I know this is rare. It is rare. Rare photo. That don't work. So, our, our, our third step, so we've, cleared, we've understood the goals, we've cleared our corridor, it's safe to work in. You know, hopefully hazard trees have already been filled, all that stuff. Danny's out there, you know, she's undoing the trees I got stuck. She's getting them down on the ground when I hung them up. My back hurts. Um, then we're going to scrape bomb bark. You know, we've, we've identified the field control. We know it's critical edge. It's pin flag, right? First thing we're going to do is we're going to scrape out the organics. That could be grasses like this, in which case he's using a good scraping tool for that. Mm -hmm. It could be grasses that have already gone to seed and they're native, not, not weeds, and we've weed whacked them so we can rake them up and tarp them, set them aside. It could be leaf litter. If you're a lake, it's probably duff, <laughs> right? Scraping out the duff so we can see the mineral soil and see the actual ground. Um, I let, when, I, when we're scraping up the organics, regardless of what they are, I like to work from on the tread. See how Dan is standing on the trail, not below it? Mm -hmm. um, he's reaching over a little this way. I might be turning the other way just because yep. I'm working uphill. Um, but Dan also has a, a bum peck, so yep. he's not working left right most today. Um, <laughs> I'm working on the trail, and I'm pulling my material <laughs> into the trail. It's not going down the hill. Right? <laughs> I'm making little piles of my grasses and organics on the trail. Look at the specs, check with the TA, what are we doing with the organics? Are we, are we have a ton of it? We're we just getting rid of it? Are we saving it for resto work? Or especially if we're doing a reroute and we're, we're building one trail and closing another, we're probably saving at least a chunk of it. So we're putting it on tarps. Maybe we're pulling it uphill into piles. Rarely do we pull it downhill to save it. Or are we getting rid of it? If we're getting rid of it, it might be broadcasting. We might rake it down. We might rake it into piles. You know, what's the spec? We'll talk about broadcasting and rake down in a little bit. Why do you pile it up? Um, a few reasons. One, so it doesn't get buried. Two, so it doesn't disguise the critical edge. Um, three, I mean, and the main reason is because if I have to go get it again, it sure is a lot easier if I can load it here into my wheelbarrow than have to be like down here and up into the wheelbarrow, right? And it's so easy to get this lower part get trampled. It happens all the time. And it looks really bad. So the, the, the less we can impact this lower zone, the better. Um, okay, so we've scraped up the organics, we know what we're doing with them, we're, we've saved them, or we've gotten rid of them. Okay, our next step is to, I don't love the term, some people used to say dig tread, I like to say excavate tread, honestly I'd, I'd almost rather say scrape the tread. Right? Because we really are working in layers. Um, and I see this guy has to be here. Okay. So, when I say scraping, we're working along the tread, right? We're not standing below it and hacking in. Even here, we're not really hacking this way. I'm not proud. <laughs> Nor shy. Carry on. Right? But we're we're scraping. We're pulling along. You know, and if we get stuck on something, and it's and it's, it's it's not just leaf, it's grasses. You know, maybe we're here, and uh, again, we're not hacking. Even if we're having to swing a little bit, it's here. It's alongside the trail. It's in the same plane that the trail is going, right? And the reason for that is the mark left behind by moving this way is pretty close to what we want our tread to look like. If we do it like this, we're hacking a bunch of holes and divots we have to go back and fix. We're mm -hmm. not doing a fire line. We're not <laughs> doing a fire line. No. Yeah, we're not, sorry. We're
we're not doing a fire line. <laughs> Danny. Not to name names. <laughs> Danny. <laughs> I'm here. Right? Now, there's a couple other things. This goes for all the stages. You know, I'm going to be working here. Generally, if the trail's like this, you know, uphill, and this is descending downhill, you know, across along the side slope, I'm probably standing on the tread. The side slope's this way. I'm probably turned like this, right? And we'll do this mm -hmm. in the field so that I'm, I don't have to reach real far. I'm bending at the knees. I'm not having to reach down below me, yep. right? The other thing you'll notice that I do a lot, besides step on napkins, it's kind of like walking out of the bathroom with TP on your shoe. <laughs> <laughs> I need to move my stuff for you. Give you a little bit of a shower today, man. It's cool. I'm feeling <laughs> funny. More than usual. So the other thing I do is, you'll notice when I'm out there working, not only am I changing positions, you know, I'm working one way, maybe I'm working the other way. Um, and I, this is a joke you guys can steal and use if you think it's funny. Probably not. <laughs> is that one of the reasons I don't work only one way, I look really, really silly with a three-pack. <laughs> if you work both ways, you can get the Trail Builder's six pack. Yeah, baby. Right? <laughs> if you only work one way, it looks really stupid. Right? Okay. The other thing I do a lot is I really, really vary the angle of my tool. Right? And the direction, like how steeply or how hard I'm swinging it, how much pressure, if I'm just scraping. Or maybe I'll tip a little more. I get some of the soil on it, so it's providing some weight in the head, so it doesn't bounce around. You know, a little pressure, a lot of pressure. I'm constantly varying that based on the feedback I'm getting from the tool. Is it bouncing around? Is it shaving? Is it digging too deep? Is it catching on roots? Are they thick roots? Are they little roots? Are we catching rocks? Am I having to sift and sort and like pull stuff up? You want the right tool. I'm going to talk out both sides of my mouth. You want the right tool for the right job. And we're going to go through tools later. Pick the right tool for the work you're doing. But every tool is versatile. And by changing the pitch, the angle, changing the force, changing how you swing it, even changing your stance will totally change what that tool leaves behind. Right? Alright. Come on. <laughs> So the next thing I'm going to, no. Um, <laughs> I like to start excavating tread. So here's our critical edge. I will get in there, and I'm going to, you'll see this in the field more. I'm going to scratch just ever so slightly just to get to organic. I'm sorry, to mineral, past the organic. If I go deep, I end up with a, a rut, and I end up too low. So I start by scraping that critical edge. That sets my elevation for the rest of the tread. That's my baseline, mm -hmm. right? And you can see that here. Even though I'm trying to keep all my material on the trail, I'm gently scraping the baseline. And I was, I was using this actually very tool today. And it's sitting right there, mm -hmm. scratching that out. Some of my material got onto my critical edge. That's why there's a rake sitting there. So I, after every step, I come back and do a little bit of cleanup. I know it seems inefficient. Oh, I'm stopping. I'm going to do clean up three times. Yeah, but you're moving such a small amount of material, it's manageable. Yeah. And you're stretching your back. You know, you're changing positions. You're not getting sore. Each tool's got a slightly different handle, so you get a different blister. Um, so the same one. But anyway, scraping that edge and doing clean up. Then we go in. Oh, here's uh, here we go. Look at this strapping young lad. <laughs> so I've got my critical edge scratched in, right? And I'm, or in this case, Dan scraping and scraping and scraping his way up slope to create a nice tread. And he's saving his material. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not down here. It's not giving him a false edge. False edge, you can step on, he thinks it's trail, someone comes back, steps and it falls down, slides away. Or a bike, it gives way. Or a runner, gives way. So we've got that excavated soil all the way to the edge, full bench, and he's working his way back up towards the back slope here. Saving the material. Mm -hmm. Here he is at this same spot, you know, going a little wider. So now he's got this, our spec here was uh, 12 to 24 inches. Yep. So, you know, here he's at like 16, 18 inches. Here he's about 24, 22, 24. 
And notice where he's standing. He's on the tray. A little above it. It's okay. A little more to reach for him. Yeah. But he's not standing down here. John, same thing. Standing on the tread, scraping towards him. This is, and I know I'm breaking the rule. People say, don't swing the tool towards yourself. But yeah, I do, quite honestly. I'm not roundhousing towards myself, <laughs> but I am in a very controlled fashion, past one foot towards the other. Yeah. That's why I wear boots. A little ankle protection if it hits a rock and skips up. That's also why I wear long pants. Because yeah. I'm pulling a lot of you can swing your balance your body just fine. Yeah, and as long as you just have a you can do you this have a place too. where it can where it's not gonna hit you. Yeah. yeah. I, I just learned how to do this and I'm I'm generally fine with it. I know how to control this tool. Mm hmm Which is me. <laughs> okay. Can I, can I so say one thing about that critical edge? Yeah. This is it's really important to me, which is the only reason I want to say it. One of the other reasons not to pile material on the edge and the whenever your stance, wherever you end up working from is that as soon as that edge has those plants get buried and you have to rake them off, mm -hmm. they yep. become compromised, they become weaker, and that those plants hold that soil stable. Yep. So it starts to weaken the edge that's already naturally going to fall away. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we really, the vegetation on the downhill side is super important to protect. Yep. Okay, so we've excavated our basic tray, right? About 5%. Some people say go to zero and then outslope it. I'd say go to a little outsloped, and you have your crew come back and take a little more usually. So it might be 10%, you're going to walk on it, you're going to use the McLeod. If you set the McLeod down and you basically put it, um, is that on the table again? Easier to see? I can imagine. You set your McLeod down. Right? And you kind of put it at both your toes and it's straight up in your belly button. Your tread's flat. Right? Mm -hmm. Unless it's the old Forest Service issue McLeod with the bolt on the bottom, that doesn't work so well. But any of the flat bottom ones work pretty well. Now, if I set it down there and it tips out and it kind of comes to your hip, you're probably in the sweet spot. That's probably in that 5 ish percent, give or take. If you set it down, you ready to catch, Jamie? I'm ready. You are the McLeod. And <laughs> right, <laughs> you set it down, and it tips over, or it is like way outside your body and kind of tenuous. You got too much outslope. Similarly, if you're standing and you feel like you're kind of going to roll an anchor or it's not quite right, too much outslope. Of those three. Mm, attributes the trail can have, those true three structures, outslope, the grade road to the hillside, or the rolling grade dip, or I'm sorry, grade reversal. In my mind, outslope is the least critical. Huh. Fetch the fails. Most important is where the trail is relative to the hillside, and that you have frequent grade reversals. There are some who disagree with me on that. But more and more, that's what we're finding, and that's kind of becoming the uh, the consensus of the of the trail building community. Mm -hmm. um, almost everyone I was talking to it in Portland at the conference this, this year was saying the same thing. Like we're almost just going flat trail, but lots of great reversals. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm push, I'm, I want to have a beer and talk about that sometime. Yeah. Because my concern is that that really influences sheet flow. It, you know, um, it, it does because it makes pinpoint. But if they're frequent, you don't have much longer velocity. Right. And um, just especially in the west. Yeah. Yeah. Anywho, um, okay. Let's see. What's next? So we've. I kind of sort of skipped the step, but not really here. Um, we may have piles of soil still sitting on the trail, right? or we may have used those elsewhere. We're going to come back to that. After we excavate the tread, that's where we tune it. That's where we fill the little holes of the rocks that popped out. Mm -hmm. That's where we evaluate, does that rock stay or does it go? If it's loose, it goes. We take it out. If it's going to become loose from people walking over it, riding over it, it's going to rattle loose, we take it out. Almost always. 
it, and then we also refer to our spec sheet. Is that a reasonable protrusion or obstacle? In which case, and it's solid, we probably leave it, or we check with the TA. This is where we look at the root and say, ah, oh, gosh, does that root stay or go? Is it in there solid? Is it a reasonable protrusion or obstacle? Mm -hmm. Or is it a toe catcher? Or is it compromised? Is it a tripper? And we pull it out. So we tune that out slope we were just talking about. Right? Okay. The other part of tuning the tread is what do we do with all that dirt? We call them spoils, by the way. Spoils refers to both the soil, the mineral soil, and also refer to the duff or top slope. Spoils, the stuff that's left over from construction that we don't want, we gotta get rid of. That's the case. Mm -hmm. We might, and yes, pirates particularly, we save our soils for that. Okay, how many times time? I'll make sure we're at 8 o'clock. All right. Maybe we're gonna wheelbarrow it up, we're gonna use it on our trail, we've got a retain wall we need to fill, we've got a causeway we need to fill, we've got a ramp going to a boardwalk we need to fill. Maybe we've got an old rut we need to fill for resto. So the default is save it to see if we need it somewhere. Even if we're digging, and our construction, our, our sheets say, okay, we can broadcast spoils. I'm going to save that because what happens if I come across a rock I thought I was going to pull out and doesn't move? And I've got to build a retaining wall around it. Or the next section, ahead, two sections ahead of me has that situation. Mm -hmm. I've got the soil, they've got deep duff, they need my soil on their trail. I save it until I know we don't need it. We used a lot today to create a giant RGD, which was also a bit of a, a jump because the yep. uh, this line on a bike optimized trail. Mm -hmm. right. We might broadcast our spoils. So broadcasting doesn't mean like meh, meh, just to the downslope side where we have a big berm and pile of it necessarily. It means we're getting it. We're just flinging that stuff. Mm -hmm. This is John. Here's the dirt, right? John. There's John. He just threw it, and it's spreading out as it goes down the hill. So broadcasting is spec when the agency wants a little bit of disturbance spread out, right? So there's pros and cons. Basically, you'll be told generally what needs to happen. But pros of broadcasting, if you broadcast well, you can sometimes kind of not really see a whole lot of impact in any one area. Downside is you're spreading that out and putting a little bit of impact everywhere, including disturbed soil, you can have weeds, you know, whatever it is coming in. Another approach you might be asked to do is rake down. And if you if you pull the rake down means taking this the soil and raking it down down the hill. Rake down is tough. You're affecting your critical edge wherever you rake down. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. If you pull your material that. into piles, it allows you to do rake down in a little bit here, nothing, 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 a little bit here. So you're concentrating that impact into a smaller area. So you have a little more impact in that given spot, but fewer areas are impacted. If we're going to be reseeding over spoils, we'll probably do rake down into little piles and then put seed, native seeds on mm -hmm. or dump over them or, or leaf litter over it, right, to disguise it. We'll probably try to pull it into some place where it looks like it would kind of that little hump would kind of match the landscape. We're raking it off the trail. We're gonna do a little sequence here. So this from on the trail, you're kind of tossing it a little ways, but not real far, right? This is with the McLeod. You can do it with the shovel. You can do it with the McRoger, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Um, and then Dan's pulling everything he just tossed down. It tends to get piled up. He's with the rake and of the McLeod in this case, right, with this part, mm -hmm. he's pulling that material downhill away from the tread. He's making sure he's getting all that stuff off the critical edge. That's rake down. We're going to do this stuff in the field too, don't worry. Okay, we're going to set the goals. Backwards. We cleared the corridor. We um, scraped up the organics. We excavated the tread. We tuned the tread and figured out what to do with our spoils. Okay, we're going to make some more spoils potentially. Now we relieve our back slope or cut our back slope. Or I like the seat rest. I like that back, back rest. Because mm -hmm. it is. I'll do that sit on the trail, lean back for during lunch. Just I check the angle. Yeah. Just comfy back rest. So that the back, back slope is this area here. And this isn't very tall in this picture. And you can do it two different ways. Here, if it's a tall back slope, quite likely. Um, 
this is a good tool for back sloping. <coughs> you might end up, you know, swing in, right? Again, your tool's moving <coughs> in the same, the head of the tool is in the same orientation as your finished product, right? Mm -hmm. So you're working on the line, you're swinging the tool, a little rock area maybe, mm. pop it out, keep swinging the tool, right? And I'm not roundhousing it, usually, um, but you're shaping it. Maybe if it's gentle, if it's soft soil, maybe you're kind of just, you know, again, tool at the same angle as the back slope, and you're just kind of shaving, shaving it along like John's doing here. Maybe you're combining those two techniques. But the idea is the back slope, instead of being vertical, is getting tapered back into the hillside, partially so that it doesn't erode and slough. So material that comes off your back slope into the tread makes your tread uneven. People walk around it, right? messing up your bench. So you want to reduce the erosion of the back slope, so laying it back to the material's natural angle of repose. Right? So what will that soil take? And then rounding it off and blending it into the hillside so that visually it's not a big, steep, scary scar. I'm changing the tunes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Dan's, Dan's back there putting on some more music. <laughs> so then, you know, here is our finished back slope. We don't really see, there's an edge, but it's not sharp. It's not the best picture because it wasn't a very tall back slope, but we'll do some of this again on Saturday. So that's the back slope. The next step, most people don't add this in, but I do. I like to season the tread. You know, where do we need to put those little anchors and chokes back in? So yeah, let's put some salt and pepper on it. Ooh, maybe a little cayenne in that spot. Right? <laughs> oh, we need some garlic here. Or maybe some of that is even off the trail. So here's winter gear again. We cut the trail. We've got, our, we've got our undulation. We've got our meander. We've got some naturally occurring obstacles like this one. Anchors. This rock we put there. We placed that to make sure people weren't going to short because we wanted to keep that little meander. And that's actually our great reversal there that if it got shortcut, the water could run down the trail. Yep. We want to make sure that great reversal stays. So we put in an anchor. Um, you know, this is where we season it, spice it up, make it fit our spec. And it could be, you know, so here's a couple of illustrations that are kind of hard to see, sorry. A couple anchors, you know, maybe we've got a, a, a tree and there's a root, and we're armoring over the root. You know, up and over it with rocks, durable surfers protect the root and make it durable. And we're, there's already a boulder and we're adding, you know, maybe adding another or something like that. So we're making it feel good and feel like a trail, not a road. Creating a gateway, placing an anchor, those would be the most common things. Then the last step is our naturalization. So we clean up our work site and camouflage the work to make sure it looks like it's always been there. So we're cleaning up with just, like, this is just a boat rake, a boat rake. Cleaning up with the tines, pulling the soil out of that critical edge. You know, again, raking it down. Pulling some out further down the hill, so this is looking, you can see the grass is coming up. Dan even goes back, standing on the trail, and he's just using, I think he's using the cloud too, you know, using that rake, and he's just, just kind of like even just standing up the grasses a little. Make it look like that trail's always been there. So that would be the trail fluffer. <laughs> yes. I'm such a Notice the chiseled, <laughs> oiled calves, right? <laughs> um, and then, so our finished trail, you know, we don't, we're not seeing much disturbance here, even though we did rake down across this. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a, I don't know, a branch to place to look like it fell off the tree. Make sure that there's a little pinch that's right across from this rock, creates a little gateway, keep people on the trail. Mm -hmm. What else do you see in that picture? I'll give you a hint, it was in the first picture. Flakes. Wow. That wasn't a plant, I actually didn't tell Dan. <laughs> the flags are still there. <laughs> flags are going to get stepped on, they're going to get bent, they're occasionally going to get popped out. But generally speaking, if we flag our critical edge, our flagging doesn't need to be disturbed. And we 
don't pull our flagging until whoever has authority to say the trail is done comes through and does it. Because they've approved the design. They've approved where those flags go. Various projects, it could be the agency, it could be someone like myself, it could be Jamie, it could be a volunteer GA. Right? So we generally don't pull the flags until it's like, yep, wow, nice job on that section. Hey, can you do this whole thing? Rest is done. Go ahead and pull your flags and move out. Or sometimes we'll even leave them. In this project, I don't know what we're going to do. There might be a couple sections where we actually leave the flags until we walk through with the Forest Service, and that could be a week later. So generally, don't pull your flag unless you're asked to. I, I have a pet peeve around that, which is if you are if you need to pull a flag, like you're moving a boulder or something, it's new, right? That's fine. Don't stand it up on the side of the trail somewhere else. Just lay it down so it doesn't look like we've now put the trail in the wrong place. And then you can pop it back in when you're done, which is great. But if not, I noticed that happened up at Brainerd. Some people had relocated mm -hmm. something. Like, oh, the trail's yeah, here. Weird. Flags are there. Right, right. I think the trail belongs here, but they could have mm -hmm. also built it totally random because mm -hmm. they moved the flags somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. There are little side notes. Sometimes as a, I could do like construction oversight. I might walk through and it's like, all right, cool, we're about done. I pulled the flags, except I left them where I want you to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good way. It's a communication tool. Okay. All right, we're looking good. We're just about to the end here. Um, so that is the general, um, you know, hand-built approach. Sometimes we're gonna have a couple more slides too. Okay. But either way, sometimes we'll have some machine work done ahead of us, and we're basically cleaning up. And what that means is the quarter's probably been cleared. You still gotta understand the goal. The core has been cleared, the organics are probably raked off, the tread is probably excavated. It might still need some tuning, that's probably where we pick up. Tuning, seasoning, cleaning up, and naturalizing. Those are generally the hand crew's job if there's been machine rough and work done. This happens to be with uh, Hicken Park in Philadelphia. Um, our spec on this was they wanted the trail six to eight feet wide so they could pass their gator, but they really had they really wanted to reduce conflict and slow down bikes. So the wider the trail, the faster you go if you want uh -huh. to challenge. This actually ended up wor the other thing I wanted is they wanted it to be uh, usable year round and they had a lot of impermeable surfaces above this in a little valley, like houses and streets above. So the water would run off, would come down the hillside, perk down to certain rock layers and then come out not to freeze. So we ended up actually doing these big gutters, almost like you would a road. A six to eight foot bench. Arch culvert drains, all this, all this crazy stuff. But at the end of the day, we ended up with, this is six to eight feet wide, but we had enough anchors and things placed um, that the active tread was only three to four feet wide, that you could mm -hmm. still have an anchor and step aside and pass. And the anchors were placed, even if they were like some of them were like 24 inches high, but they were kind of ramped up so the gator was, it was passable if they needed to. Mm -hmm. So here, you a lot of the clean work, cleanup work, coir mat, uh, annual rye as a cover crop, um, some weed-free straw as cover. You know, so that, that would be some of the volunteer handwork on a really heavy-duty project. And actually, that was volunteers that did most of the cleanup work. We ran the hydraulics. They did, they built, made it look pretty. So we'll finish, you know, sometimes machine work will we'll finish that. There are several WRD projects with it. Let's talk a tiny bit about maintenance and repairs. The biggest thing I want you guys to take away from this whole section on maintenance, because we're going to be asked to do it, you know, put in rolling grade dips, deberm, nick, clear the corridor, that kind of stuff. I want you guys to always think about, okay, what's the symptom I see? We're not fixing the symptom. We're fixing the problem that's causing the symptom. So see the symptom and say what's the problem and then what's causing it. Always ask yourself that. You know, in this case, oh, the symptom is there's all these trails. So we're going to close these trails. We're going to drag a bunch of sticks. Or put rocks in these trails, which are just going to look weird. And then the next thing that will happen is there'll be another trail over here. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the water is running down the singular trail. The problem in that case is the location. There's some, you know, so making sure that similarly, if we're like, oh, there's water running down the trail, 
we need, and there's a rut here, we need to fill the rut. No. I mean, yeah, we got to fill the rut, but that's just, solving, that's just addressing the symptom. What we need to do is we need to get water off the trail. Probably not just here, probably upstream, up trail. Mm -hmm. We got to get the water off, right? So, one of the things that we'll do fairly frequently is deburning. We've got our bench. There's been some compaction. There's been some displacement. We're going to shave out this out, shave off this outside edge that's trapping water. That's called deburning, right? The illustrations that look like this, by the way, are from that that IMBA book that we talked about at the very beginning. Um, These are reused so in the OSI yeah. trail manual that we use also. Yeah. Yep. So I've sent some of those around if people want to check mm -hmm. them out. Okay. So again, what happens there? You know, a couple things can happen. with Deberming would be taking off this. We've got compaction and displacement. Deberming. Uh, generally, the specs will tell you whether this material should go back into the tread or just be gotten rid of. Generally, I just get rid of it because otherwise it just compacts and displaces again. Mm -hmm. Slough is what happens when material comes off your back slope and collects right here in this lower hinge point. So desloughing would be scraping this out to reestablish your bench. Mm -hmm. Deberming is taking this out. A nick is opening up an area. It's kind of like deberming. You're not making a funnel though. It's almost the opposite of a funnel. A funnel would take water and direct it into a narrow spot, right? We actually are doing like half of a bowl where we're opening it up and letting water that's trapped disperse, spread out. These are, these are long. These aren't like little things. You know, these are 5, 10, 15 feet so in diameter. Yeah. And you don't even really feel them. It's done right, you don't even notice you're doing any work. So like there. Really hard to see the nick, right? Mm -hmm. But it's there. Now, we can give a nick some HGH or some steroids and we turn it into a RGD, um, or a rolling grade dip. And so we basically have, so the trail is descending in this direction, basically have a nick, we take all of that soil, plus some more, and, and load it on the, on the, down, uh, the down tread portion. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of this almost like a spoon cut in half lengthwise. Right? So you've got a little scoop here and a big long hump and long tail handle. And these are long. Your nick is still 5, 10, 15 feet. Your ramp is 10, 20, 30 feet. This is a long structure. But the idea is it's not abrupt. It doesn't stop water abruptly. It doesn't become an obstacle for users that are going to go around like water bars mm -hmm. do. Water bars tend to fill up very quickly. They fill up. They're usually not installed right. They tend to fill up. Once they fill up, water comes over the, the water bar, right? Accelerates as it comes over the log. Starts to undercut. Now it looks like a step. Step is a fancy word for obstacle. And people tend to hike around it, right? So we don't do we don't do water bars very often. Usually RGDs. They last a lot longer and they feel way more natural. Here's a picture of an RGD. Right, very subtle. Like you wouldn't see it if the arrows weren't there. Right? Very subtle. Here's the drain. Here's that ramp. Mm -hmm. Notice the two McLeods. They have extra outslope here. And at the top of your ramp, it's almost not quite vertical, right? But this less outslope. This is exaggerated outslope here. We don't usually put those in a corner, like if you were coming down here and turning, we wouldn't usually put it here because we're putting user forces into shear instead of compression. So we, we think about where we locate those. Here's another RGD. Here's that ball. So we rolled the ball down the trail and it tapered off. Here's the excavation. Here's where the material went. Notice that we excavated at a low-ish point where we could get good drainage away. And we put the soil up over the, you know, where the tree was helping it, the tree's root system and rocks were helping to support it. And 
here is one from Winnegar. All of these are little grade reversals. This is that, that trail that's almost dead fall line. Not quite dead fall line, just off a little bit so that we can get rid of water at some of these points. Each of these is a yard and a half of soil. That is uh, three or four backhoe, not arm buckets, front end loader buckets. Each one. Three or four buckets, three or four buckets, three or four buckets. Big, long, subtle structures. Here's the problem with water bars, right? Um. Water comes down. In that case, it's going around. Right? I put in so many of these. Oh, they were so cool. They're like the laminated water bar with the mud flap, yeah. like the little conveyor oh. belt stuff. Because then bikes and you know tr hikers wouldn't trip on them as bad. They pulled down and go back up the bikes. Except that they weren't. They had the same problem as water bars. They filled in, water came over, accelerated, and got a rut. Mm -hmm. And then people would go around them. Right? How about these? Same idea. Yeah. A friend of mine works for the county, he doesn't call them water bars, he calls them sails. Oh. <laughs> and he still works for the county. You see the process of undercutting happening there, right? Mm -hmm. And all that sediment, where does it go? Into that little creek. Okay. Anchors, we talked a bit about, right? You've seen that picture before. Anchors, chokes, gateways, corralling. They're all really different words for the same general concept. Something that kind of manages user and keeps them on the trail and makes the trail feel close and intimate. Exposure. So this is interesting. We usually think of anchors as rocks, trees, things, big, bulky, massive hulking things. Absence of thing, <laughs> like absence of ground, drop off to the river, like steep hillside, also works as an anchor. People, whoa, mm -hmm. hey, hey, they kind of hedge away from that a little. So you can actually use exposure as an anchor. That's more of a design cue, but it, it works even uh, you know, at, at, a design at, a, at a construction level. Um, a tree that's dropped across here and will buck out a little section, all of a sudden, that new trail looks like it's been there, and it must have been there for a long time because it was there, and then a tree fell across, and they bucked it out. Mm -hmm. That's also a gateway. It's an anchor. We'll do that intentionally. We do a lot if we're trying to convert a road to a trail or a wide trail to a narrow trail. Mm -hmm. Right? You guys see the wide corridor here? Right? Wide bench. Narrow active trail. We got some meander. This was done actually to slow down bikes in this particular case. Mm -hmm. Just right over it. Uh -huh. See any anchors or gateways there? You don't run fast over You know, sometimes actually that's, yeah. you know what, that's actually Cross a good country. point. Sometimes we do build our anchors such that they are challenging features you can go over. Mm -hmm. So now you're actually making it more fun for the folks who want the challenge, runners, mountain bikes, whoever it is, mm -hmm. or stuff kids even play on that are hiking, while slowing people down, mm -hmm. less user conflict, while making the trail feel more tight and intimate. Right, so we're trying to achieve multiple goals at once, not just balance one thing versus another. Yep. We're trying to blend them. See any uh, anchors there? Gateways? Mm -hmm. Fun. Any yeah, obstacles? Okay. So we see some obstacles, we see some gateways, we see some gateways yep. on the micro scale, but we also see it, you know, like we're drawn to this spot, aren't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we also see on the macro scale, we're kind of something tells us, hey, we want to go to here. This is essentially a gateway. And we've got these two trees sticking up. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that both micro and macro scale. Um, some more anchors. Here's that same Winnegar Ridge, those timber steps where there's the illustrations. This is the done. Mm -hmm. Right after construction, a bunch of rocks and replantings done so that the, the most attractive, the path of least resistance. Is the, is the timber steps. Otherwise, I mean, this is an obstacle, 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 a right? bunch of obstacles, but we made the non-trail more, had more obstacles, less attractive for travel. Yeah. Now it's all green. You can barely see the rocks because the currents are growing so well. Yeah, we're awesome. just right over them. Yeah. These are kind of oh cool. Oh this, oh is this is down in Mancos. That's cool. Through a gate. But yeah, that's actually a non-moto, non-cattle gate. 
Um, runners, hikers, bikes really like it because they don't have to stop and open and close the gate. Yeah. And forest service and ranchers don't have to worry about gates being left open. True. And it keeps motorcycles out. And it's fun to ride over. Um, yeah. 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 Those are fairly fun. Um, there's a couple other little things. We got all sorts of good little <laughs> junk in our pack. It's heavy. <laughs> it's a heavy pack we carry around. We got a lot of good shit in there that we can use in various techniques. It's 8.30, by the way, so we're running a little long, but we're almost done. Um, got Resto. This is near Sugar Mac. This <laughs> is where the trail was. District Ranger came up there. We showed her the new trail in the closure. We said, here's the old trail, here's the new trail. She's like, w where are you going to put the new trail? We're like, no, no, no. This is the new trail. That was the old trail. That's where the new trail's going? No, this was the old Like, you couldn't <laughs> tell. That's it was cool. so cool. It was so well done, so well blended and matched to the existing, you know, to all these cues. Brian's really good at this too. You guys probably know Brian. He used to work here. Yeah. He was there this weekend uh, as a volunteer now. Um, he's got a really good eye for looking at the natural and mimicking it in the closure. That's one of our tricks. Turns, you know, sometimes we got to gain elevation. And so we can do various types of turns, switchbacks or climbing turns or a hybrid climbing turn. Mm -hmm. um, so ways of change in direction. Um, we've been using a lot of this style. I call it a hybrid turn. Some call it a bike wall. Yeah, or a um, um, switch turn. But you know, we use a lot of these, so we have a great reversal to dump water because at some point our trail is on the fall line, and water that gets on it won't leave, and we have another great reversal to get rid of it again. Mm -hmm. um, here, you know, we're putting this user's turning. If that was flat, oh yeah, it'd be he, a runner or a cyclist be putting forces into shear. Here, we're putting those forces into compaction, making the trail harder, not looser. But the trade-off is we're also trapping water on the inside for a little bit, which is why we're getting rid of it above and then getting rid of it again right after. We use that a fair amount. Um, less likely to get shortcut than a switchback in most cases. You know, we'll look at who are the primary users on a trail and maybe decide what kinds of turns. Interest, by the way, a good trail is a good trail, like 90, 95% the same regardless who's on it. It's a little like, well, we do this if it's bikes, this if it's hikers. That's a little nuanced stuff to help manage those users, but also to make the trail as fun as it can be for certain users. But, you know, 90%, 95%, it's all the same mm -hmm. in terms of the basics of a good trail. Full bench, rolling contour, grade reversals, anchors, chokes, all that stuff, the drainage. That's all true regardless of who's on the trail. We've got retaining walls to shore stuff up. You know, we've got, there's a, there's someone, there's one that some WRV folks built on Waldrop last year. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these rocks were placed. Mm -hmm. Right? That's one of our tricks. We've got steps to push grades. You know, that works better with hikers. Not too well with horses, not too well with bikes. Sometimes you can do stone steps and steps on one side for hikers and little ramps for bikes and runners. Runners can kind of do either. Mm -hmm. um, we've got armoring where if we have a steep pitch or soft soils and we need to harden the tread. We can do this as stone pitching, this style of armory. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, this is this. Mm -hmm. This is like 25% grade, poor soils, heavy use, but I need to feel efficient, so we hardened it with the stone pitching. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. There's, there's three main hardening techniques, flat stone paving, stone pitching. This is my favorite because it's fast and you can use rocks that won't work here or big boulders as a causeway. Mm -hmm. Again, you can kind of see how they go together. We'll probably do a little of that on our workshop in August, just as practice. There's more stone pitching on a much bigger scale. That was also in the Philly. This, this stone pitching had such big voids in it, you could stick your arm in it. It was to let water and ice through. Mm -hmm. That's six feet wide. This is this same area. Just looking at it from the other end. Sometimes we'll do punch-ins, you know, for wet we have techniques to deal with wet areas. That's a punch-in at Little Raven near Brainerd. Um, there's causeways and boardwalks. This would be what I, these terms vary regionally. 
slope in the west. Completely. I would call this a causeway. I would call the thing we just saw, I would call that a puncheon. Type mm -hmm. 2 puncheon. I would call this a bridge or a boardwalk or a bog bridge, maybe. There's another puncheon we built the wall drop last year with oh WRV. Yeah. That's beautiful. That was Isn't that nice? Notice yeah. it's not straight. We still play, uh, still apply the same design aesthetics for a trail to our trail structures. Doesn't need to be straight. Had a floodplain, so we did some arch culverts wow. and a bridge, right? So there's there's these bag of tricks. But what do you notice about <coughs> all these things? They're hard work, a lot of labor, really expensive. We have these tricks in case we need them to solve anomalies. But you don't want to do a whole trail system with this stuff. I mean, you could end up with trails that was a million miles, a million dollars a mile. This actually, this trail actually was a million dollars a mile, almost. We did just under half a mile and it was $300,000. Hmm. And then the Union Goons showed up with their black link and told us that they got mad because we weren't Union. Huh? We asked yeah. if they had a trail, a TS1, a trail specialist one, and they didn't know what to say. Was um, that was Philly also, yeah. Um, optional features, you know, off trail features, usually this is for bikes. Um, I've seen some running clubs really promoting this too, uh, especially in like Bend, Oregon. Um, so adding some challenge in that. optional yeah. lines versus people going faster on the same trail. It's one way to provide, have a trail have uh, appeal and meet a variety of different users' needs. Mm -hmm. Test out that rubber. Yeah. So the big thing here is we've got a bunch of different tools. I think we're gonna, you know, the, the take home for tonight is just that there are different tools for different purposes. You got digging tools. Shovel's not one of them, by the way. You got scraping tools. You got prying tools. Pulaski is not a prying tool. Sometimes, maybe. This little guy <laughs> breaks <laughs> off really easy. You know oh what yeah. that is? Yeah. That's a plastic. It's a digging and a cutting tool. It's not a prying tool. We've got scraping and moving tools. A shovel is a scraping tool and a moving tool. McLeod's a scraping tool. We've got carrying tools. We've got the tool tool at Dan. <laughs> We're going to go into that in the field. Speaking of the field. Jamie, what are we doing in the field? We're doing Saturday. How do you want to do this? Where do you want to meet? What time? Um, we already sent out project notes, project details. It's got it in there. Um, we're meeting at, I think, 8 to 8.15-ish. 